wanted to introduce uh, Joe Powers and John Burns from the Main Venture Fund. Uh, this today's program is around startup boards, farming, and serving. Uh, John and Joe have lots of experience in, in, in investing, and Joe is an entrepreneur, and John has been working uh, forever. John, you've been in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Maine. Uh, he is one of the stalwarts there and uh, really uh, has been doing a lot of good work with a lot of companies across the state. So I'm just going to turn this over to them at this point in time. So while, while Terry is doing that, just a, just a thank you to this group for having us this morning. We're delighted to, to share a few things about boards. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that we're going to cover in these next 54, 52 minutes or so. In, you feel free to take notes, of course, but uh, we will be happy to share this deck with anyone after. And we, we uh, sort of erred towards adding more detail in, in written text here. Uh, so hopefully it is a good resource after the fact. And of course, it's being recorded as well. So that will, that will be helpful. So just a quick agenda, as, as all, all hopefully all good meetings have at the beginning. Uh, we're going to just talk about why we're here. Uh, like I said, I'll introduce uh, the main venture fund and uh, briefly John and myself. We'll talk about startup boards in general um, and make a distinction, an important distinction between advisory boards and boards of directors. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the value of, of a board, establishing a board, serving on a board, what makes a board effective. We'll talk about the anatomy of board meetings and then list some additional resources at the end. And our assumption going in here is that there's a, a, a broad array of experiences. Some of you have or are serving on board. Some of you have not uh, and really are coming to it rather new. So it's, it's trying to speak to more of the least common denominator experience, um, giving, giving the basics and, and building up detail from there. So just why are we here today? So the, the, the goal is to talk about startup boards in the ways that I mentioned in the agenda. And we wanna specifically talk about this from really from two perspectives, or at least let you get uh, two perspectives out of it. One being as ACE members, how do you advise your clients who are putting together boards or uh, have functioning boards and are looking to optimize uh, the efficacy of those. And then also serving on boards yourself, whether you're thinking about it, whether you're currently serving on boards um, and, and sort of what that means. So hopefully by the end of this, this talk, uh, and we, by the way, feel free to, to jump in with questions um, at any point, we will leave some time at the end for Q and A. Hopefully at the end, you'll, you'll have these two different perspectives or at least a better handle on them. So what is Maine Venture Fund? We have been in operation in the state of Maine for the last 23, 24 years. Um, it, Maine Venture Fund is a very unique model as far as state economic development tools. We are a pool of money that gets invested into Maine companies, uh, and that investing is done by John Burns and myself. And like I said, I'll let John introduce himself shortly. Um, when we invest we are doing it in a venture capital model. So for those of you who aren't aware, that's basically in a nutshell, you're, we're buying part ownership in, in private companies. And the goal working with those companies is to help them grow at a significant rate. And then somewhere down the line, experience an exit, which is usually an acquisition to a larger company. The business owners, the investors get paid back, hopefully with some sort of dividend or you know increase in that original investment and then in, for, as far as main venture fund goes when we get those exits we get those returns on our capital we then recycle it into other main companies and that's what we call an evergreen structure and it's the the structure that we've been operating under for the last many years um, we have 28 companies main companies in our portfolio currently we've invested in 70 plus companies over the course of time and in almost all of those cases we have a, a pretty uh, involved board role. So, um, so John, I want to give you the floor for a little 30 second thumbnail on yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. It's a great introduction and nice to be here. I, um, it's nice to see a lot of um, folks that I know, old friends and, and some new faces. Um, I don't want to try to remember the last time I presented to ACE um, at the Portland country club. It was a long time ago, but anyway, good to be here. And thanks for, for having us, um, 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm John Burns. As Joe said, I've been managing the main venture fund for a very long time. Um, uh, some of you may know that the statutory, statutorily given name for the fund is the Small Enterprise Growth Fund. We rebranded about a decade ago um, to more clearly state the mission of the fund, as Joe described it. Um, so uh, we operate as main venture fund, but if you hear the term small enterprise growth fund, um, that is one and the same. Um, yeah, so um, happy to be here, and I think that's enough of an introduction for me. I, I was at Unum for many, many years, um, and then began managing this fund uh, also many years ago. So despite the fact that I'm still 38 years old. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and John, John has the real wisdom here. Uh, and so you're stuck with me driving the presentation, but uh, he'll, he'll jump in um, when, I, when I stray off track. Um, uh, so, so John, uh, John runs the fund, and I am his right hand in doing that. I, um, I have worked at startups throughout the course of my career prior to Main Venture Fund, um, tried my own hand at starting a company, um, got an MBA somewhere in there, and uh, and I've been at the fund for the last couple of years, so really, really enjoying the experience. So finally, sort of diving into the meat of uh, of what we're talking about. So we thought it would be helpful to start by just further defining this sort of differentiation between advisory boards and boards of directors. Um, in general, both categories within those categories, they vary in structure um, across different, different verticals. So you can look at different business stages. Are they just getting started? Are they uh, raising money from outside investors? Is it, is it a public company? Is it um, a business type that's a for-profit or non-profit? What industry is the, is the business in? Um, and then there are requirements, public companies have requirements for boards, private companies uh, do not, except in the case that maybe uh, an investor requires it as part of investment. So these are just sort of different considerations that affect how a board is put together. Um, and we'll dive into sort of much more deeply what that, what that means. But on a surface level, advisory boards are, are much more a simple construct. So these are really sort of a, think of it as sort of a team of mentors that come together informally around a CEO to help them make decisions. And the CEO is, you know, these might be meetings that happen, you know, at the behest of the CEO, the group may never actually get together as one group. It might just be one-on-one uh, -on -one individual discussions. Um, but the board of directors is really more uh, what, where we play um, and all the companies that we invest in at Main Venture Fund, one of the requirements that we have for investment is that a formal board of directors is formed or has been formed. Um, and so we're going to talk much more in depth about the board of directors side of things today. Um, and certainly, you know, if there are questions about sort of where the two diverge along that path, uh, let us know. But this is, you know, this is roughly sort of how, the, how they diverge in these major categories. Specifically with the board of directors, this is a you know, contractual group. You're, as a board member, you're sort of signing up for assuming fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the shareholders of the company. You have the power as, as the board to hire and fire a CEO uh, along with other responsibilities, and you're actually voting uh, and creating record for of these decisions. So emphasizing that's where we're gonna spend most of our time because that's where most of the detail lies. So what's the value of a board? Uh, board of Directors, in a nutshell, is a legal entity with that fiduciary responsibility I mentioned to the shareholders of a company. So in, in a few different, m few different ways, um, other aspects of, of the value that the board brings or why the board is formed is it's really a link between those who are providing capital uh, in the form of existing shareholders, you know, the founder of a company or investors. Uh, and those who are using the capital, and this is the management team making making the day-to-day -day decisions. The board members, as as we all know, are bringing their personal networks and skills, and the 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 numbers really bear out having a board. So when when this can be quantified, um, companies that have boards and that have good governance practices significantly outperform those that do not. So there is a there is a business case for forming and maintaining a board. 
And last but not least, uh, boards and CEOs should have a constructive relationship, not an adversarial one. This seems pretty straightforward, pretty obvious, but it's actually, as, as many of you probably have experienced, um, oftentimes a CEO, w especially an inexperienced CEO, will view a board with a little bit of skepticism. You know, they may have started the company to, to be their own boss um, and not to have to answer to uh, now, you know, now a, a group of people who are making decisions um, that, that they don't have as much control over. So, um, so it's, it's natural in some cases for a CEO to not really fully understand what a, what a board's function is um, and, and have that you know, skepticism or cynicism um, and so the, the sooner uh, a CEO can kind of understand and, um, and get past that, if it's, some, if it's a barrier, certainly the better off, uh, better off they'll be. And, and for those CEOs that have been there, done that, uh, the value of a board is, is obvious in retrospect. And so they, they go into it really working to establish those relationships from the beginning. Um, and then finally, the reflection and the planning piece all of the things that you need as a CEO to bring to a board meeting to be prepared help you as a decision maker um, to to not only kind of see read the tea leaves but also keep your team in sync uh, and on track. So establishing a board, I'm just going to sort of keep plowing through here. But John, please uh, please ch chime in and or anyone else if you have if you have questions. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to assume there are none unless, unless, uh, unless I see a little something pop up on my screen. And I might miss it popping up on my screen. So, Terry, uh, if you see something, please uh, interrupt as well. Absolutely. So stop. Yes. No, just confirming that uh, I'll let you know. Great. So establishing a board. It, another another seemingly obvious um, observation, but building an effective board, the first thing you really need to do is understand the needs of the company itself and, and what roles are needed. And in so doing, creating a formal board structure in terms of how many roles do I need on the board? What type of directors do I need? Um, that's important. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the subsequent slides here, what that really means. Um, but it's really a, a, a process, a practice of, of a little bit of a skill matching. Um, so what, what, based on the type and stage of, of your company, where are the gaps? Um, where can uh, a board member add value? And some of the ways in which you might evaluate that is you might look at, well, what's the competitive advantage of the company? So where do we want to really pile in resources? Um, what are the demands in the company? And what are the changes expected in the next few years? So trying to anticipate looking forward, what, what is this, gonna, this company going to need to be successful? What technical expertise uh, is needed? Uh, role, what's the role of marketing, research and development, customer service, and an access to funding? You know, does, is, there, is there someone on the board or someone in the network who can be that bridge? You also want to establish the relationship formally between the directors and the company. So this is a sort of a contractual arrangement that dictates or at least outlines how decisions get made and who's responsible for which. Developing a list of candidates finally, once you have you know, a sense of how, what the form and shape of the board should take, creating a board profile grid is a helpful exercise. And we have a little snapshot of that coming up. Uh, but that's basically a way to say, you know, where, where are these gaps that I just mentioned? And then how do the folks that we're looking at as candidates um, you know, hit those, hit those, check those boxes or not. And then finally recruiting and networking and, and getting your board kicked off. Um, and this is sort of like fundraising. It, you know, it's in, in a sense, uh, the networking piece never, never really stops. Um, and so it's common for a company or a CEO to sort of have board potential board members in the wings um, when, when and if uh, a, a new board member uh, or a new seat opens up. Just a couple of other um, comments on sort of the structure. So s boards of directors commonly have, and the larger a board is, the more likely it is to have uh, separate subcommittees, which can take particular 
issues offline outside of a board meeting um, that take too much time or, or focus and, and come back to the board with a more of a finished product or a recommendation. These might be, you know, existential threats that the company faces that take a really hard uh, detailed look that the, the regular board meeting doesn't provide time for, or it could be, you know, reviewing financials in, in depth. But typically these committees are nominating committee, compensation and audit committee. Um, nominating committee is essentially helping to source um, candidates to bring in, you know, human resources into the company. Compensation committee is setting the CEO's uh, compensation and approving options and, and reward, rewards for employees of the company. Audit committee is, is again, looking at those financials and, um, and making sure there's no, um, there's no sort of fraud or just sort of lazy accounting going on. So, uh, you know, back to the, the idea of number and type of board members, this is a little bit of a grid to sort of help orient. So along the top, you, you have different stages of a company based on sort of how much loosely on how much funding they've taken in. And then on the X axis, we're looking at this across ownership, the board composition itself and, and any committees, um, like I mentioned on the right of the slide here that might, that might um, be relevant. So at a startup phase, and this is really thinking about a company that's, you know, maybe hasn't taken on any outside investment. And I suspect that this is, you know, a, a common sort of stage of companies that ACE, ACE members are working with. Um, this, is a, this is a very common phase for advisory boards, right? So I haven't taken on any outside capital. I've just been bootstrapping. I've got uh, a few members of, of a board of advisors who I'm, are casually advising me on various aspects of the business, but I don't have regular monthly or quarterly meetings um, and I don't have any committees. Um, it, even if this is a board of directors, it's a little bit more formal. Um, it'll probably just have, you know, those three members um, keeping it small, keeping it nimble. So when you start to take on capital, now you typically get into a more formal, um, a form, more formal five member structure. And this is very typical. So this is almost all the companies that main venture fund first invests in. Um, has this five member setup. So two common shareholders, which are common shareholders being, um, you know, usually the founders, the owners of the existing shares of the company. You might have two uh, series A, it's, it's called here, but also called commonly preferred. So these are the investor seats. Um, and these would be filled by the investors themselves or, or uh, folks that the investors have appointed. And then one independency, and this is really important. This is sort of the tie-breaking vote, and it's it's uh, someone who's really sort of impartial, not you know not a family member, um, ideally not someone who's uh, an investor, but you know typically someone who's a uh, area expert um, and can bring sort of um, you know market or industry experience to, to the fold, but, um, but isn't, you know, isn't really sitting on the fence of the, the, you know, the founder or, or the, uh, investor. And then as you move to the right, it gets, you know, you might add, um, you might add more funding, you might add more members, but ideally this, you know, the five member board is really the most, the most nimble. Um, and you know, you, you hear of boards being, you know, nine, 11, 13, and even larger, and it gets, pretty unwieldy. In general, you know, nonprofit boards tend to be a little bit larger than private boards. Um, again, we're mostly talking about private boards and, and what I'm describing today, but, um, but there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of, you know, function of, of private and nonprofit. Um, I would also just point out at the bottom, you know, board observers also what might be in the room for board meetings and occasionally a, a, a CEO might bring in, you know, their co-founder who's not on the board, or they might bring in a key uh, supplier or someone to present to the board. So there are other folks, you know, in the room, but these are not voting voting members. All right. So just a, an eye chart here for those of you who <laughs> like a challenge. This is uh, this is a an example of a matrix, um, sort of a a roll chart that 
by the columns is saying, you know, this is board member one, board member two, board member three, four, five, um, and then also indicating that these are either common seats uh, or investor seats or that independent seat. And so what it attempts to do is really tick off, you know, what is what are the competencies of the person who sits in each one of these seats? And you can look and you can see where is their overlap and where are their gaps. And sometimes overlap is good. In this case, all three of the members have entrepreneurial experience. And I think that's a great overlap. In other cases, you might say, well, you know, we don't need everyone to be um, you know, a financial professional. We'd rather have uh, some someone who has industry experience, for example. So this is a way to just see that objectively and evaluate. So further on this sort of establishing um, step, the, the roles, responsibilities, compensation expectations, as I mentioned, there is a sort of formal delegation of authority contract. And so that's something that at the outset, um, it's, it's best practice for the CEO and the board members to, to agree on these things. It's kind of like, um, think of like an operating agreement when you're starting a, starting a company with a couple of founders, right? You want to, you want to know upfront what is, what is coming and, and how this is going to work. Um, it just helps smooth things uh, on the, uh, as you, as you go. Typically board members um, are, board members can be compensated. Uh, the typical compensation might be options um, for, for shares of the company um, you know, when a, if you look at a five person board, typically the only person who might get additional options would be the independent because the common shareholders who are the, typically the founders of the company, they already obviously have, um, a big slice of the pie. The investors have a slice of the pie. And so the independent, so this is a good mechanism for independent, um, and board members or board members who, who just don't have ownership in the company. So it's just a, a nice way to compensate um, if you're able to, able to do that. And the best way to find potential directors, as you could imagine, would be th is through a pr your professional networker, your being the CEO, you being the CEO. Um, and then also there, you know, obviously around any company and, and as you're part of as ACE members, there are uh, key support support folks, attorneys, accountants, investors, consultants, um, and all of these people have their own networks. So, um, so CEOs will leverage, probably leverage your, your own networks as ACE members uh, if, they're, uh, if they're doing it right. And you wanna, you know, very importantly, avoid potential conflicts of interest. So when you're looking at the board grid, um, you know, one of the things to kind of keep an eye on or have a lens for is where is there going to, where could there be potential problems? And examples of this might be, uh, we have, you know, two, um, two siblings on the board together. And, and that's, you know, that's a potential conflict of interest for obvious reasons. Um, you might have a board member who has a company that's in a competing space or a potentially competing space, um, something to avoid if possible. So there are various uh, areas where um, you, you just, you know, you want to sort of flesh that out at the beginning and try, try to avoid it if possible. And then, you know, f f if, you're, if you're doing this in a formal way, there's a job description and orientation packet that would go to a potential board member that, you know, if you are, if you, again, you being the CEO or the company, if you're recruiting, candidates want to know, what am I signing up for? And so to the extent that you can, um, identify that that's that's uh, helpful and then lastly the dno stands for directors uh, and officers insurance and key person insurance these are just a couple of um bits of liability coverage that a company you know may want the dno being i guess more operative here this is protecting the board in particular for decisions uh, that the board takes or doesn't take um, that uh, could have legal consequences down the line. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but, but the legal aspect of what you're signing up for when you step onto a board of directors is, um, is important to consider. We'll, we'll circle back to the legal piece. So serving on a board, um, and, uh, and again, you know, apologies for the, the long bullet point lists here, but just trying to be kind of um, inclusive on the page. 
So just running through some of these, the, the probably the most important and the, um, and the primary role of a board is the hiring and firing of a CEO. And then uh, by, by extension, determining compensation as well. And this is something that obviously, you know, going back to some of my comments at the beginning, it's difficult for, it can be difficult for a board and a CEO to maintain, you know, that, that deep level of trust when the CEO knows that, you know, at, at the end of the day, the board is, has the power to, to oust the CEO if things aren't going well. Um, it's, it's especially tricky because as we'll, as we'll talk about, a CEO is, mo is best served by being very vulnerable and transparent to the board to say, here are the challenges that I'm facing. And by doing that, you know, the, the one, one would, might be concerned that uh, one would open one's self up to, um, to concern from the point of the board and, and maybe, you know, hey, if I, if I tell them everything that's going wrong, are they going to replace me with someone else? Um, so it's a balance of, of a little bit of that tension um, and, and ultimately everyone's best served by, by transparency and just sort of having, a, having that level of trust that, hey, things are going to go uh, sideways and, and we'll, we'll deal with it, we'll work through it. But, you know, at the end of the day, because the, the board is, uh, is beholden to the shareholders of the company overall, if the CEO is, is not performing their duties, um, then it's in the best interest of everyone to make a change. Uh, the secession specifically, the second bullet point, uh, we, we have, uh, in my experience, I've heard often, you should start planning for secession of a CEO on day one. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a strange twist for some folks, but it's really, you know, it's, it's a, again, a very um, eyes wide open approach to knowing that um, every CEO and every board member, board member for that matter, has a life cycle. And to the extent that you um, can plan for that and have those contingencies in place, even if it's five years out, um, that just gives you, makes you better prepared if and when that needs to happen. So the board is, uh, as a board member, you're also reviewing and approving the management's operating plans. So typically you'll have a you know, forecast for at least a year out to say, this is what we're gonna, this is what we're gonna do. Here's our sort of expected, um, P and L and, and budget um, and all of those things will be looked at and scrutinized by a board and approved officially. Board members help establish key performance indicators. So this is really important and, um, and it's you know, not just approving them, but helping a company de develop key KPIs is something that's an ongoing process. And, and I think um, is a really, when, when, you, when you have well working KPIs that you can report on and and track over time, um, it's, a, it's a huge leverage to helping the company um, sort of le level up their performance. Long-term strategic planning is really important, uh, in, especially in many startups' lives where they're burning cash. There's a end point where you know, they've got a five-month runway, and at the end of that, they're out of cash. And so they've got to make sure that you, you as a board member have to make sure to help them to you know, make sure there's cash in the business before that point to keep, keep things going. I mean, at the end of the day, um, I would say, hey, maybe, maybe even more important than hiring and firing the CEO is, you know, don't, don't run out of cash. And that's, um, that's something that is easier, you know, seems easy, but um, can, can, be, can be tricky, especially because oftentimes these companies are bumping right up against, you know, ca zero cash. Just as a little time check, it's um, 40 after. So I'm going to, pick up the pace a little bit, um, but, but again, please, please jump in. Just ticking through the rest of these. So serving on a board, you're bringing credibility, which helps with the fundraising process for investors like John and myself. It's, it's great to, to know, especially when a company is two people, that there's a you know, three, four, five person board behind them that has uh, added expertise. Ensuring that legal compliance, we'll talk more about that. Evaluating the performance of uh, yourself as a board member, the, the group of the board, um, and the CEO is all part of serving on a board. Um, there may be specific decision-making protocols that investors have asked for when they're, when they're investing. And then lastly, responding to crises. Um, and these are 
you know, these, these come up case in point 2020 and how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and, and, and oftentimes uh, that might entail a lot more time than you expect than when you step onto a board. So one of the things that is important for folks to know who haven't served on boards is yes, it can be uh, the expected, you know, four hours a month uh, preparing and meeting, but there are, there can be months or many months in a row where you're close to full time helping that company dig out from some existential crisis. And, um, th- and those, those swings in, um, uh, in, the resources that you're able to provide, uh, it's it's important to have the bandwidth to be able to do that if if those crises come up. Uh, this is just a quick quote. I won't read through it. You may have read it already, um, but you know, just goes to show some of the more soft skills that board members bring um, in terms of establishing a relationship with a CEO and providing value. Legal requirements, uh, important. So the golden rule is that, you know, you, you really have to act in the, in the interest of the shareholders. And that's the thing I've said a couple of times now, but what, what does that really mean? Um, there's, a, there's language, language around this uh, called in, in, a, in a simple f- format, duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of confidentiality, duty of disclosure. So by care, we really mean you're taking the time um, and effort to make the decisions at the board level um, for the, for the best interest of the company. You're not just sort of, you know, rolling up and you know, glancing at the the materials and and saying, sure, that sounds good. Uh, hey, Joe, I, I think we have a question from Arthur. All right. The uh, the description you've given of board roles is significantly different from what we're used to as consultants. Mm. Would it be inconsistent or, or, or even a conflict for somebody to be both on a, on a board and serving as a consultant? That's a great question, Arthur. It, it could be. Um, you know, if you, it depends on, I, I think, partly on how you're being compensated. Um, what you're, if, if when you join the board, the, the responsibility to the shareholders becomes prim, primary to anything else. Um, and so, so if you think about it that way, and then you evaluate what is the consulting arrangement, um, I suppose it could be done, but, uh, but oftentimes that gets, that gets tricky. And, and oftentimes if you're going to move into a board role, you would sort of seed the, um, the consulting role, or at least sort of be doing it more pro bono. John, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, the safest tack is clearly the latter. Um, uh, as a board member, your your duties are, as Joe said, to, to all shareholders. Um, if you become a contractor to the company or the CEO, um, you know the the possibility for either real conflict or certainly perceived conflict um, is there. So um, best to avoid that. Um, we have had cases where board members, and because they have a specific area of expertise, um, have been paid to do a very discreet piece of work that the rest of the board acknowledges, agrees that it's, um, that it's discreet, that it doesn't touch other areas and that it's important for the company. And so, you know, with sort of full disclosure and very heightened transparency, they, they make it known that, that all are okay with this, but um, it can get tricky. Mm -hmm. Uh, A a quick comment uh, for Sam. Um, I'm on I'm on a board as a ad, ad hoc non-voting member because of the fact that I'm a consultant to the company as well. But I attend all the board meetings and um, am looked upon to provide input and uh, participation in strategic decisions, etc. But I can't vote on them. Yeah, thanks, Sam. That's that, and that is a that's a more kind of typical arrangement if you uh, if you want to maintain that sort of consulting relationship. And then, you know, back to the board of advisors, it's also, there's also a little bit more wiggle room there where again, it's, it's informal. There isn't, uh, there aren't these legal requirements. And so, you know, if you're a consultant, you may very well be an advisor to the company as well. Um, especially depending on how the company wants to message, you know, who their advisors are around them. This duty of loyalty kind of gets at this, right? Which is you, you, you can't act in your self-interest, um, which, which arguably as a, you know, as a consultant, in many cases you are, you, you have to act in the interest of the company. Confidentiality and disclosure are, are fairly straightforward. 
at the end of the day, it's important to understand that you open yourself up to legal risk by joining the board of a company. DNO insurance helps by protecting you from some of that, but, uh, but for sort of egregious uh, cases where you are sort of not observing these different duties at the top, uh, you, there can be consequences. So those are, those are things to be aware of when you, uh, when you agree to join a board. Another eye chart for you. So I've tried to, um, I'm just going to talk about the, the sort of starred items here, but this is a helpful sort of um, comparison of characteristics of effective boards and ineffective boards. And so uh, just, um, just to list a few of these off that I thought were especially salient, the first present a well, this for, for a, a characteristics of effective boards, presenting a well thought out agenda ahead of time is really important. That sounds obvious, but, you know, typically it's, you know, you need to be at least three working days in advance of the meeting. You have a, you know, a well thought out, not only outline, but whole package of all the materials, the financials. Um, that's, that's sort of a, uh, a base, base level expectation. Um, conduct a formal annual performance evaluation of the CEO, have routine executive sessions among non-management board members only. So the best practice here, executive session is we're going to talk uh, amongst ourselves, ourselves being anyone on the board who's not in the company day to day. And typically those conversations are after the board meeting is over, maybe a 15 minute time budgeted at the end of each board meeting to say, how's the CEO doing? You know, how's this particular uh, human resource issue being dealt with or you know, anything that, um, that, a, that a company might want to address. And so those, those, are, those are important to just have on a normal basis so the CEO doesn't raise their hackles and, you know, are they talking about me behind my back? If it's, if it's a normal process, it's a little bit easier to, to have that discussion ongoing. A few more of these promoting continual director education. So, uh, you know, helping, helping the board continue to improve on its own, uh, continual CEO education as well is important. Uh, making sure that folks are informed when they arrive at the board meeting. So you've read the materials you've prepped and you're not reviewing the financials, for example, for the first time in the meeting and participating in free and easy communication outside of the boardroom. Uh, the quote that was on a, a few slides ago ex was an example of a little bit of that. So, you know, helping make those phone calls or, um, or providing those candidates, those types of things in between board meetings is, is all part of the package. Ineffective boards suffer from denial, fail to act and make decisions. They regularly hold excessively long board meetings. Um, we have all been guilty of that maybe at times. Feel, feel compelled to say something and be heard. So, you know, the, the low ego, um, high EQ type individual is a really valuable board member. Um, and, and when someone doesn't have that characteristic, it can really bring things off the rails. Uh, don't maintain regular board meeting attendance. Um, that is, a, that is a characteristic of an ineffective board member and also delivering inconsistent messages between the, meeting, um, between the meetings uh, and the meetings themselves. So in other words, I didn't have the fortitude to say, hey, I don't think this is a good idea during the meeting, but then I circled back with the CEO afterwards and I said, and I voiced a bunch of concerns. That's not very helpful. Um, just a, moving on to anatomy of a board meeting. So, you know, we've got the board in place. Uh, we're, you know, ready to, ready to roll. Biggest, the biggest thing that you hear from board members as a comment to a CEO is don't surprise us in the board meeting. We should have uh, obviously all the information in the board materials leading up to it. But even before that, if there's something that is material, um, to use the word a different way, in the, to the business, whether good or bad, we, we want to know about it when it happens. So send us an email, uh, send us a text. The board materials themselves, is, there's obviously a lot of ways to skin the cat, but typically you have an overview page, uh, which might include primary risks up front. One board member that I work with, a, a board chair often says, tell me right away, tell me what's keeping you up at night. Every time we talk, that's what I want to start with. Um, and that's a way for the challenges not to get buried later and then you run out of time. Typically, you'll have a sales update. You'll talk about product development successes or delays. 
um, related KPIs. Talk about, of course, cash, cash, cash. Where is the company at? What's the burn rate? People highlights, um, anything in terms of resources or people needed that the company doesn't currently have. And then what, what's going on in the next six to 12 months? And what are the, what are the things that we want to uh, all be working towards? And every meeting will also include meeting minutes. And, and then uh, on a more irregular basis, you would want to dive into some of the sort of more strategic discussions around, you know, what are the existential risks we face or what's our sort of three-year strategy, five-year strategy type of discussion. And that's obviously you know, not something that you want to talk about every month, but um, important to, to regularly address as well. So what are meeting minutes? How do they... Um, you know, what's the, what's the structure of, of good meeting minutes? Typically, uh, you have a, a board secretary or maybe you have an attorney who's taking notes. More often in some of, some of the smaller companies, many of the companies that we work with, is, it's just a board member who has volunteered to take notes. Um, but the idea is those notes will be taken, they'll be circulated after the meeting, anyone will add input, and then they'll be formally approved at the following meeting. And, and typically, those notes will include the list of who is there, um, what are the votes that were taken? What are the major topics that were discussed? Um, any requests from folks at the in the board? Um, talk about sort of the re any reporting from these subcommittees that may have uh, specific items on the agenda. Any human resource matters? Looking ahead, and then any action items. So you know, typical of of uh, meeting notes that you might take for uh, for a, a non board meeting. And the scorecard on the right is another, <laughs> apologize, it's another, another um, eye chart. But this is something that we could send anyone who's interested. This is something that we built at Main Venture Fund to almost as a evaluation scorecard for a, for a given meeting. So the, the idea here is to enable um, anyone, whether it's a board observer, Main Venture Fund sitting, sitting in a board meeting or a board member, um, or a CEO for that matter to say, how did it go? Did we kind of check all the boxes of what a successful board meeting looks like? Um, and, and the hope is that by filling this out and providing it to a board or a board chair, um, that, that, a, that a board can kind of slowly move towards a, a, better, um, a better format over time. And it also kind of gives a guide for, hey, you know, what is, what is the expectation for how many KPIs I should have? Or what is the expectation for how often I should be talking about my exit strategy? So, um, so I, I, that's just a tool that we have in our back pocket. Um, more, more charts here and no need to decipher these, but the overall point here is this is an example of a hypothetical KPI dashboard that might be included as one page in that board materials deck. And the key takeaway here is that you're managing and uh, reviewing numbers over time and also looking forward. So you can see on these graphs, you have sort of an expectation of what, where is the company going to be moving? And then when you look backwards in time, you can see how is the company done versus that plan. And that's just a really helpful way for the, for the board to see consistently what are the things that we care about and are we meeting those objectives. From a sales perspective, you know, sales is always so vital for especially young companies um, or any company for that matter. So, you know, having a pipeline report is very helpful. Sometimes you might circle a couple things and say, hey, here's, here's where we're, you know, not converting or here's something I want to talk about in more detail. But by having this as a standard format, um, it's hard to take in seeing it for the first time as we are now. But over the course of time, if this board, if a board member had this same format, each board meeting, they start to quickly understand where, sh where should I be looking for um, anomalies or, uh, or successes that the company is having. And, and typically, these would always have a little bit of a blurb um, context from the CEO that says, this is what this means. And you might have a product development roadmap as well. We've all probably seen Gantt charts some, some similar to this. Um, and again, this is showing sort of plan versus actual versus looking forward. So 
In other words, looking back and looking forward, how, how are we doing? And final drum roll. So additional resources here, uh, again, happy to provide um, any of these, but we, we, uh, li I linked the MVF resources page. This is on our website and we have um, a guide, a board guide, which has a lot of this content in it and more um, on that resources page. You can find that um, again on our website. There's a, a several books, um, white papers that are helpful. And then the National Venture Capital Association uh, has a lot of uh, helpful resources as well. So that is a wrap. We're uh, five minutes to 10 and we can take questions. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any questions from anyone in the audience? Sam. Um, one thing that um, I run across in some of the boards I've been on is an annual shareholders meeting in which the shareholders will uh, appoint the directors who in turn appoint the uh, officers of the company. Do you want to speak to that for a sec? Yeah, it's a, so um, something that I meant to point out. So uh, depending on the different roles on the board, whether someone is a common board uh, board seat or a preferred board seat or an independent board seat will dictate who gets to vote on filling those seats. So if it's a preferred seat or investor seat, uh, the investor gets to, gets the say, uh, if it's a common seat, then the common shareholders as a group get the say. Um, and if it's independent seat, typically it's a combination of the, of the other four in the case of a five person board. Um, anything to add to that, John Burns? Yeah, another angle on that, Sam, um, as you know, is uh, many, many states have a requirement that, that companies uh, hold annual meetings. Um, many privately held companies um, sort of uh, wave that off with a, with a waiver from, you know, a limited amount of shareholders or, or board or, or what, I mean, you can dispense with that, that pretty quickly. Um, but many, many companies uh, take that uh, responsibility more to heart. Um, and we've got a number of companies that, that go out of their way to try to have a an inclusive annual meeting with all stakeholders, shareholders, um, or unit holders. Um, and to the extent that there are seats that are, as Joe said, there, there's usually a, um, you know, sort of a bifurcated election of directors, depending upon which class of shares you hold and, you know, which directors get appointed to which seat as Joe just described. So, but yeah, it's really best practice for companies in, in our view to have uh, an annual meeting of investors so that people can, ask questions and, and hear the story directly as opposed to, you know, filtered minutes through board or, or whatever else. So I have a question and uh, this has to do with industry experience versus general experience. So uh, I think on one of your charts, Joe, you had talked about industry experience being one of the um, items that you'd look for for a board. Uh, is the opposite also the case where you look for someone with alternative experience in order to, for that diversity of ideas to be on the board? Yeah, it's a great, it's a good question, Terry. And I didn't really speak to that, um, that picture that I had on the right side of one of those slides. The diversity of ideas um, is really important. And, and oftentimes this comes in the form of, of, of diversity in general, right? A gender, racial, ethnic diversity, um, but at the end of the day, the reason, you know, the reason why you want that, that diversity in all those forms is to have different perspectives in the room. So, um, so it, it depends how you structure a given board obviously depends on the company and the company's needs. But if you had all experts in all industry experts on the board and, you know, no one who, you know, really knew sales or new finance, for example, I wouldn't be that helpful. So it's kind of a matter of, it's balancing, how do I, what are the things that I care about? How do I canvas all of them across the five people that I have? Where are the, where are the places that I can afford to have gaps or not? And then, and then if there are existing gaps, you know, maybe uh, that, that's sometimes you see advisory board members complementing boards of directors. One of our companies has uh, three different sort of um, industry boards as well as their board of advisors, um, I'm sorry, as well as their board of directors to, to focus on 
three different aspects of their business in, in much greater detail. So there's ways to overlap as well to, to make sure you're covering those. Yeah, I would add one of the, the overarching themes, I think, in, in, the, in the slides we just went through is, um, uh, in my view, the, the most effective board members are people that take their board fiduciary role seriously and are really good at exercising a board role. Um, and, you know, if, if I had someone who was an expert in the industry versus someone who was great at the at what I just described, I, I would take the person who's great at doing the fiduciary role. I mean, the, the, the role of the board, hopefully the management team fills out the expertise needed. If a board member knows something about the product or the market or has financial acumen, those are great skills to bring. But the, the best run boards in my experience and view are those where the board members, there's an expression, um, noses in, fingers out, right? So they they dig in, they understand what's going on, they, they hone in on sort of the, the key drivers of the business. Um, they focus on the emotional and intellectual health of the, the management team and support them and challenge them uh, in any way they can um, and really um, help to guide the business, keep it out of trouble, keep it focused on the long-term strategic growth um, and, the, and the things that need to be accomplished to achieve that. Um, you know, board members who, um, yeah, anyway. So, uh, you know, Joe mentioned uh, emotional intelligence. I think a, people with high EQ that work well with others that can understand sort of all aspects of the human condition as people drive toward these high growth successful companies, those make the best board members. Great. So I have a question. So that's on, a, on the governing board that you're talking about. And you mentioned uh, somebody, uh, one of your clients has a number of advisory boards. Um, it, is there a role for consultants um, on advisory boards so, um, so that they don't have to worry about the governance aspects, but can actually um, participate in the company um, with the expertise they have? I'll, I'll take that one. I guess the, the short the short answer is yes. Um, as, as Joe described, um, advisory board members are not subject to the um, you know the regulatory and legal requirements of statutory board members. Um, I think more typically is your your board of advisors. You know, in the case that Joe described, that's a you know very technical science based company. So the advisors are people that have expertise in that particular um, mm -hmm. realm. Um, they will often and often do contract with consultants to support their advisory role. Um, so I think that's probably where uh, consultants are most used, you know, um, probably less likely to convene a board of advisors, which are really a board of consultants that you're, uh, you know, you're compensating for work that you, uh, that you give them, but, but possible for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Joe or John? Arthur. You suggested earlier the importance of, of the CEO being candid in reporting to the board and that, uh, that problems are not swept under the rug, but really reported as challenges to be looked at jointly and sometimes strategically. When that's not present, how is that, how is that best dealt with? You know, uh, as your question implies, Arthur, that's that's a very tricky one, right? Because um, uh, as was pointed out, the, the board, one of its primary responsibilities is hiring and firing the, the CEO. Um, so uh, CEOs do worry and, uh, you know, it makes sense. Uh, our human nature is to be a little guarded about um, exposing our our flaws and our weaknesses. So, so certainly CEOs are going to be a little bit guarded. Um, and they want to put a best face forward with the board. So I, I think that's a const, constant tension uh, that needs to be managed. And that's sort of back to my point about board members that have high EQ and are demanding and challenge their management teams, but also understand the, the challenges that the individuals on those management teams face every day. So, you know, that in order to have that sort of transparency uh, from the management team, including the CEO, I think you know, that, that's, that's based on trust, right? And that, that takes a little bit of time. So whatever 
board members can do. And in particular, the board chair is the person that sort of sets the tone and tenor for the board, I think, right? That's the person that's reaching out to all of the board members, hopefully regularly. Um, I have one board member who's great at his role, and he says he talks to all the other board members at least once a week. Uh, and he talks to the CEO once a week, at least. Um, so keeping those relationships alive um, is, is critical and building that trust is critical to having that real transparency. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, it's the cult culture on the board does trickle down to culture in the company and, and vice versa. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, setting a, setting a tone and there's a little bit of a responsibility there for board members to, to help inculcate that in the, in the company itself. I mean, you, you, you have benefits of, tr you know, trust benefits the company at all different levels. So it's important. It's important for that as well. Yes, Dick. Um, as somebody who just recently uh, retired from working for a lot of larger companies, what would be the best way to um, get my availability out that I'd be willing to serve on a board and, you know, kind of identify what expertise I might be able to lend? Uh, uh, John can, can add, uh, I would say finding hubs like Main Venture Fund, for example, where we have 28 portfolio companies or, or Main Center for Entrepreneurs or MTI um, that, that have a large group of, uh, of companies in their, uh, in their ecosystem and, and put yourself forward with sort of your background and what, you, what you're looking to add and what company you're looking to work with um, could be a strategy. It's, I don't know of any one comprehensive database, either you know, statewide or, or nationally, that does this very well. Um, but if you can find those nodes, uh, that's, <clears throat> that's one way to be efficient about it. Obviously, you could go to individual companies themselves that, uh, that speak to you in whatever way and, and offer yourself up. And then, then it's a little bit of a numbers game to see if, uh, you know, if they're in need of a board seat. But uh, those are two strategies. John, anything else? Yeah, that's pretty much, you know, we're, we, we'd love to get your resume deck and, and know, you know, what kinds of things you're interested in. Folks at MTI, the same, as Joe said, Main Center for Entrepreneurs, you know, they've got their cultivator programs and many other programs. So they're always looking for people who are willing to step into those roles. There is also a, a national association of corporate directors um, uh, and one of their executives is, is here in Portland, actually. So, it, you know, that, that may not be the scale you're looking for, but that's available as well. Thank you. One, one, one area that is usually um, also looking for board members is the nonprofit sector. And that may be a way in as well. Yeah. Yeah, didn't there used to be a, an organization in Portland that was actually did board training? Might have been for nonprofits. I, yeah, the ICL did, a, did a, uh, a couple of board training programs, one for for uh, young, uh, young consultants who wanted to learn how to serve on boards. I think there's been some transition there. It was Institute for Civic Leadership. And then I think it became something like a Lift 360, um, which has, uh, I think, faded away. But I do think that that function um, uh, of board recruiting and a board resource resource um, may have it has moved on. The, yeah. um, Dana, there, do you know about it? Excuse me, this is Dana. The, there's a very comprehensive training program offered, or was anyways, by the Maine Association of Nonprofits. Um, I, I served on a nonprofit board for a while and, and uh, sat in with the executive director in that program. There was a program both for director, for CEO, executive directors, and for board members. And it's very, very good for nonprofit situations. Right. I actually know of a, a funder that required um, nonprofit board members to go through the MAP program. So mm -hmm. it's been around for a while. I think it's called Board Boot Camp. Okay, any other questions or comments for Joe and John? Okay, well, thank you, uh, gentlemen. This, is, uh, this has been great to learn more about boards. Uh, and thanks for contributing to uh, another one of our continuing ACE programs. Um, we'll uh, kind of circle back here and do some introductions, but I wanted to let you know that even though we're virtual, 
We will still be getting you um, a, how do you put it, John? Uh, John Shorb? Uh, Memento. Memento, that's what it is, right. Okay. A facsimile is in my hand. I haven't figured out how to do a virtual paperweight yet, so we're doing real ones. <laughs> That's coming uh, coming soon, I think. Coming soon, all right. So, well, thank, yeah, you so all. thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and feel, uh, I think I'd like to open it up and have everybody kind of do an introduction now that we're, we've are we gone through the thing so we can kind of check in. So feel free to, to hang out, guys, if you'd like. And uh, we've already, we know a little bit more about you guys. Um, but I'd like to just go around and see how everyone's doing these days because we haven't seen each other much in the last year. So uh, I'll just call on folks starting at the top of my screen. So uh, Peggy Siegel. Hi, thank you. Uh, as chair of the membership committee, we are very busy keeping ACE at um, the forefront of people's minds, we hope, um, to increase membership. And I'm also the editor of the newsletter, and I'm hoping that you're reading it uh, regularly for opportunities for you and your um, you as a consultant or service provider, because we have a lot of opportunities there. So um, thank you all. Uh, Bob Labrie. Got to remember to unmute. My name is Bob Labrie. I own a training and uh, uh, consulting practice. Used to be training and speaking before COVID. It, primarily, I would go out and do sales training, and that changed everything. So now we're we're more on the consulting piece. Um, we're we're getting ready to launch a new program that involves um, another consultant down in Pennsylvania who actually uh, trains consultants. She has a thirteen week program. So we're pretty excited about this. We, uh, somewhere downstream, will be soliciting help. And with a little luck, uh, we'll be launching this very soon. And Bob, you're going to give us a few licks of Stevie Ray Vaughan on that axe back there? Yes, indeed. No, no. But maybe later. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, Dana. Well, um, I don't know. Maybe John and I should do this together. We don't really have much of anything new to report. You guys mostly know us. Uh, we're the Delphi Group. We're um, organization development consultants, and uh, of late, we've uh, been working mostly with local clients, doing a lot of coaching. Um, we typically work with uh, smallish companies lately, um, although we have a history of working with some very large corporations overseas. We're focused on alignment, um, good management practices. Um, our backgrounds are different. John used to be an engineer. I used to be a psychologist. I guess we still sort of are. Um, that's it. John, why don't you pick up anything else? Um, I defer to you. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's enough, life. I think. Thank you. John's version of ditto. Um, Sam, Bishop. Um, I'm, uh, I think most of you know me, uh, Pace Consulting Group. Uh, we work with small companies, uh, helping with general management type issues from everything from strategic planning to funding to productivity improvement and financial assistance. Um, my uh, last year, or right now, I have been uh, as busy as I uh, could ever want to be, which is good news. I have uh, five ongoing clients with a few projects thrown in on top of that. Uh, from time to time, I'm sitting on <clears throat> four boards um, or three boards and one advisory board. Uh, so I'm busy um, and I do some mentoring when I uh, am in between things anyway. So it's been a good year. Um, the companies I've been working with have been very fortunate to be on the on the plus side of the COVID and have turned uh, pivoted very successfully with um, finding ways to uh, take advantage and or uh, survive by reorienting themselves. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to a really good 2021. Thank you, Sam. 
Uh, the first of the Toms, Tom Renahan. I wish our screens were lined up with, like yours, Terry, because they don't line up the same, so it's a surprise when you call on us. No. But that's all right. <laughs> uh, Tom Renahan, I'm from Yarmouth, Maine. I am a leadership uh, coach, and I work with individuals and groups on leadership skills. Uh, currently working with a few small companies in and around Maine, and I have a, a pretty large product project planned for later this year with my national client. I also serve on the ACE board, on the program committee. I also serve on a um, volunteer board, um, and it's a, a organization called Maine Youth Leadership. I've been on this board, I think, about eight or nine years, uh, and we do a high school uh, leadership program once a year for high school sophomores, uh, and recently have converted that to an online program for our alumni. This board's been around for about, four, uh, this organization's been around for 45 years, helping uh, young people in Maine grow their leadership skills. Great. Uh, the next Tom, Tom Morgan. All right, thank you, Terry. It's, uh, don't, don't mind the sun, I'm sitting east facing here, so right around 1030 is when I have my max sun. So uh, I'm Tom, I, uh, I focus, really I'm an outsourced VP of sales, and I focus on helping companies with sales strategy, sales process, sales structure, you know, all the way down through creating compensation plans for, for their sales folks. And I think looking at it right now, a lot of, a lot of companies that I'm working with uh, have had to adjust in many, many ways their sales strategy and how they cover things. So spending a lot of time on that, it's, uh, you know, there's a different way of, of, of selling right now than there was. And I'm sure Bob's seeing it in his world. But sales has changed and, and uh, really helping companies create the strategy to go after, uh, you know, this changing environment. So it's uh, been quite an interesting uh way to do it. Uh, like Bob, I'm used to dealing with people live and in person, but you know, we all learn new skills and that's the beauty of being a consultant. You learn new things every year and you apply them and then you help teach other people these new skills. So looking forward to 2021. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dick Hall. Hello, I'm uh, recently retired from full-time work at uh, uh, engineering consulting firm. I've now opened my own firm, which is Energy Projects Development, Energy Projects Management, excuse me. Um, currently, I have two major clients. Um, one is an offshore wind developer, and then the second is an environmental client where we're working on brownfield sites to bring them back into production. Um, I also spend about half of my time at, as a senior leader in Rotary International. Great. Thanks, Dick. Uh, Carla. Yeah, Tom, you were right about that surprise aspect. Um, so I'm Carla Doremus Tramfield. I'm here as a guest. I recently met Terry through uh, Maine Mentor Network and excited to get, get going with Top Gun 2021. I um, relatively new to Maine, been here five years. My career has been in business to business spaces, mostly in the chemical industry as uh, both in large companies and as an entrepreneur. And now I have a consulting business, KDT Business Strategies, and I try to bring expertise in the areas of marketing, branding, business management, and com building competitive strategies in, in a targeted way in the business to business space. And I've done some work with nonprofits as well. Um, I'm on the advisory board of Boots to Roots, which helps military transitioning to Maine. I'm former military myself. So I'm also on the uh, finance committee for the board of the ACLU of Maine. And that's been really, really rewarding in this last year and a half or so. So thanks for letting me sit in and I'm really impressed with what I hear. Well, thank you for, thank you for being here. Arthur. Arthur Fink, uh, Arthur Fink Consulting. I help businesses and nonprofits find the questions they need to look at, not answer the questions, but identify the questions. And I think there's a, a lot of closeness to the discussion today about uh, about boards and advisory boards. Uh, interest. I've been on a number of uh, of boards for nonprofits. A uh, very brief story. On one, the the CEO was so enamored of the organization's mission that he was led to a series of quite unethical and probably illegal activities to advance that mission. If you think that service on a on a board is just a, a, a joyride of enlightenment, uh, sometimes you take on headaches like this, and there's no escape except facing it head on. 
Thanks, Arthur. Uh, Priscilla. Hello, everyone. Uh, Priscilla Hanson Mahoney, Blazing Trails Coaching. And I will print off the chat at the end of this call if you want to put your contact information in chat so we can continue to connect with you. Uh, my company is Blazing Trails Coaching. I help business owners get out of their pickup trucks and on top of their businesses. And as such, I just signed on a new client uh, who is an arborist in Naples, which I'm excited to start working with. Great. Uh, Bernard. Uh, Bernard Moore here in Portland, Maine. Um, I recently left the uh, consulting field and I am the chair of the board and president of the organize of a not-for-profit organization called People Powered Innovation Collaborative. Our work is developing, um, testing, and disseminating uh, methods and tools for organizations that are interested in moving from a shareholder to an all-stakeholder model of operating. Great, thank you, Bernard. Um, Carrie. Um, I'm Carrie Yardley. I'm a lawyer in the greater Portland area. And um, because of COVID, I'm, I'm based in Yarmouth right now. Um, I uh, One of the problems with being an attorney is you really can't talk about what you're doing or name the people you're doing it for. So we'll pass quickly over that. Um, I wanted to um, explain um, how I met Joe and to ask a question of the group. Joe called me and um, his question was, could ACE be a resource for potential board members, both advisory and, um, and, uh, and governing? Um, and I said, sure, let's talk. And we've been talking and, and ultimately it led to this program. But if you are an ACE member, um, or even if you're not, you have some ideas on how um, ACE could um, uh, help you find board positions or whether we should have some kind of a program where we offer that service, please get in touch. Um, I'm easy to get in touch with. It's um, outreach at um, consultexpertise.com or my personal uh, email address, which is on the website. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. I, I would just broaden that to say, you know, we, in part of our response to Dick's question earlier, I think. We, we are a potential node for finding board seats on, on private companies in Maine, but I would say also you know, if there are folks in this group who are looking for clientele and see our portfolio companies as, as part of your target demographic, it's always helpful for us to, again, take those resumes, as John says, and put them in our database such that when a company raises their hand and say, hey, I really need a, a sales expert, we can call up Tom and say, Hey Tom, we've got a we've got a sales challenge for you. So uh, encourage that as well for what it's worth. Great, great, thank you. Um, I think the last but certainly not least is Judy. Okay, I'll be good to put the video on for if I have to. Um, my name is Judy Jones. Um, I love what I just heard about. Uh, being able to get our members in front of uh, another group like that. So that's terrific. Uh, I'm on the membership committee, so that's a, a wonderful thing to hear as a possible benefit for our members. Um, I am, like I said, on the membership committee, I'm on the board, and I'm also the one that manages the website and the one that you guys all emailed this morning saying you were missing your links, even though I sent them out yesterday. Um, and beyond that, I hang around with websites and online marketing. So thank you very much. Great. Right, thank you, Judy. Everybody, and uh, have a great morning and day. Thanks, all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.